Good morning, Christ Center. Happy Mother's Day. Ooh, I feel loud in my own ear. I don't know if they can fix that. <laughs> good morning, good morning, and happy Mom's Day. I just want to give a shout out to all the mamas. Um, being a mama, I know that most days we wake up and we're desperately looking for the, the manual on how to do this thing called momming, even as an adult. I mean, as a 50-year-old, I have adult children now, but I'm still most days trying to figure out how, how to love my children well. So nice job. You're doing it. You're rocking it. On those days when you don't feel like it, just go, yes, Stephanie said I'm rocking it. I'm doing it. Um, momming. Okay. So just so you know, this morning isn't just for mamas. It's for all of us. And as I was praying and thinking about today, I really had a burden on my heart. And I hope that by the end, um, you will understand the burden that I had. And hopefully you will feel some hope. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you're going along, you're doing life, and, and somebody approaches you and they say, hey, will you coach a team? Will you lead a group? Will you organize an event? Will you do something? And you kind of have this mixed first reaction of like, oh, that kind of sounds fun, but also equally um, you have the, I don't know, I don't know if I'm qualified, I don't know. And so you say, hey, you know, let me think about it, or Christianese, let me pray about it, and you walk away. And as you're walking away, a lot of times something happens. There's this thing that happens where without even really realizing it, this dream just slowly begins to burn and catch fire. And you begin to think about what would it look like if I said yes? How would it play out? And oh, and I would, I would want this, and I would expect this, and I would think this, and, and you begin to dream. And, and oftentimes we don't realize it. This happened to me um, when my kiddos were youth soccer age. And I had somebody come up and they said to me, they said, hey, would you coach a youth soccer team? And both things, I'm not really qualified, but sounds kind of fun. So I said, let me think about it. And as I walked away, I began dreaming about and thinking about what it would be like to get to coach my own kiddos and how much fun to get to know their friends and how much fun to get to know their families and just the community. And I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And so I said yes, and I immediately went to the library and checked out every book on soccer, read about the rules, read about how it all works, made my plan, and I'm so excited. And I get to the first meeting with my team, and I'm like, where is everybody? And they're like, well, this is it. Here's your roster. Well, there were six kids on the roster, and I was like, I thought there were 11 people on a soccer team. This is when I knew that my expectations were not going to be met. This was not going to go the way that I expected. It gets better. Okay, so we kind of have our first get to know you practice. They get their stuff. And in youth soccer, sometimes you're lucky to get one practice before the games happen. So we kind of just had our initial meet and greet, and then it was game time. And so I show up to the game with my six kiddos. I have one girl and five boys. And I'm kind of watching the parking lot, and out pops the girl out of the car, and she's got orange and black bows in her pigtails, cheer shirt, cheer skirt, tights, orange and black knee socks, face paint. She is ready to cheer. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Uh, and so the game, the game starts, and I put my six out there, and so she's out in the middle of the field cheerleading. I have another kiddo sitting out there picking worms, out of the grass and happily, proudly showing the crowd his worms. I have another kid within five minutes like, coach, coach, I'm like, you okay, Jay? Coach, take me out. So I, I, I call him off. He's like, I need a drink, but aren't the mountains just beautiful, coach? Okay, so that's three of my six. The other three are out there teaching me bunch ball. I didn't know the term, it wasn't in the books, but bunch ball, if you don't know, is where all the kids chase the ball just around the field. And it was in that moment that I went, oh, my dreams of developing pre-Olympic soccer players 
was just crumbling in front of me. And I began to realize that my hopes and my expectations of how this was going to go probably weren't going to come to fruition. Maybe you've experienced this with parenthood. So maybe, you know, as you're kind of going into the young adulthood, you don't even realize probably that there's this dream beginning to burn inside of you that someday you'll be a parent. And a lot of times we just don't even know that it's in us. And you're going along and you're a young adult and you're just beginning to adult and you're in the grocery store and you're putting your groceries in the cart and you come around aisle two into aisle three. And there in the middle of aisle three is a two-year-old throwing the biggest temper tantrum you've ever seen. They're kicking, they're screaming, they're yelling, they're spitting. And you're like, my kid will never do that. <laughs> right? The expectation. Fast forward four or five years. You're in the grocery store. You are the parent in aisle three with your kid throwing the temper tantrum. And you go, but, but I was going to be the perfect parent. I was going to do it. I was going to be the one to break the mold. And not only that, but I was going to be the first one ever in history to have perfect children. And then slowly, that, that expectation, that hope, that dream just slowly begins to crumble. So what do we do? And it doesn't just apply to parenthood or coaching. It can apply to anything in our lives. All throughout our lives, without even knowing it, we have dreams, we have hopes, and we have expectations inside of ourselves. A lot of times we're not even really aware of them, but they're there. And then over time, when that person doesn't meet our expectation, or that thing we said yes to doesn't fulfill our hopes and dreams, what do we do? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And I want to start clear back in Genesis, the beginning, where it all started where humanity started, where we started. And here's the crazy thing. So in Genesis, the very first part of Genesis, God is like, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And he got to humanity and he said it was so good. And then something happens between the first part of Genesis and chapter 29. And I guarantee you by chapter 29, God is not going, it is so good. Things have crumbled. In chapter 29, there is a story, and I'm going to tell you the story. And it's a story of deception. It's a story of lies, manipulation, control. It is a messy story. Not only is it messy, but one man has four wives. It's in the Bible. Um, and when, when we read this story, it's shocking. And you might be asking, why would you pick this story on Mother's Day? It's, a, it's an odd choice. But I'm picking it because there is one person in this story that captures me, that she, she inspires me and she shows me how to get from that place of the pain of broken dreams and unmet expectations, how to get from there to a place of praise. So we're going to talk about that this morning. So there's a dad and his name is Laban. And Laban has two daughters. He has his older daughter, Leah, and he has his younger daughter, Rachel, and they're of marrying age. And the Bible says this. The Bible says that Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. So Laban, the dad, the two sisters, and along comes into the story a man named Jacob. And Jacob is also of marrying age. And Jacob gets introduced to Rachel, and the minute he gets introduced, it's Hallmark. It is love at first sight. He is smitten with her. He is in love with her. And you get the feeling that Rachel equally feels the same way about Jacob. And so it's this love story, and Rachel takes Jacob to meet her dad, Laban, and Laban invites him in to stay as a guest in their home. And so week after week after week, he's still a guest in their home. And Laban finally goes, hey, Jacob, we need to have a talk. Let's talk about this. You're still here. <laughs> and so uh, Jacob says, well, I have a great idea. Why don't I work for you for seven years in return for your daughter, Rachel, in marriage? And Laban says, hey, that is a great idea. 
So Jacob works the seven years, and he's excited about it. He's so excited to marry Rachel, and he does his seven years, and he says, okay, Laban, it's time. And so Laban plans the wedding, and the wedding happens, and Jacob wakes up in the morning to Leah. Wait, that's the wrong sister. If you have read this story, you wonder every time you read it, how did this happen? How did he not know that he married the wrong sister? There's theories. Uh, there's maybe the idea that there was a lot of alcohol at the wedding. Maybe because it was dark and there was no electricity. Maybe because brides were covered from head to toe. Maybe all three. But somehow Jacob ends up married to the wrong sister. So Jacob in the morning is mad. And he goes to Laban and he says, you tricked me. You deceived me. And Laban says, well, you know, we always marry off the first girl first. So Jacob is like, ah, frustrated. And so uh, Laban makes a deal with Jacob. He says, here's the new deal. Finish out Leah's bridal week, and then we will give you Rachel in return for another seven years of work. And so uh, Jacob finishes out the bridal week with Leah, the unpretty sister. And then he marries Rachel, and the Bible says this. So Jacob slept with Rachel, and he loved her much more than Leah. Let's imagine for a minute that we're Leah. Sorry, guys, but girls, can you even imagine? You're not the pretty sister. You're not the eye-catching sister. And now you are married to a man that is angry as heck because he married you instead of the sister he wanted to marry. Your dad didn't want you, so he pawned you off. You have been a part of your dad's deception. You've been a pawn in your dad's world of working things out. Can you just imagine Leah? How she has got to be feeling, especially like during this bridal week? I mean, it, it, it's just like it's unreal. Like it's hard to believe it's even true. And so... As the story continues in Scripture, we read this. When God saw that Leah was unloved, I add my own words, and unwanted. When she was unwanted and unloved, he enabled her to have children, but Rachel could not um, conceive. So the pain for Leah must have been great. I mean, more than we can even imagine. The whole brokenness and dysfunction of the story. And she is right in the middle of it. And so we then read, and I, what I want, this is the part I really want to, to draw out, to draw to our attention this morning, is that as Leah, it's interesting, because as she begins to name her children, her sons, she gives them very specific names that invite us in to her journey, to her pain, to what she's going through. It's kind of like a journal almost of of what's going on inside of her. So the first one, Reuben, she has a son named Reuben, and she says, behold, a son. It's kind of like, you know, the first one. But then she says this. She says, God noticed my misery, and now my husband will love me. So we see in this that Leah had a faith in God. She believed in God, and she knew that God saw her, and she knew that God knew of her misery but we also see within her this hope, now my husband will love me. I did it. I did something to make me lovable. Now he will love me. And then she has a second son, Simeon, to hear. It means to hear. And she says, God has heard that I was unloved. So we see here that not only does she have a faith, she believes in God, but she also is talking to God because she says, God has heard me. He's heard that I was not loved and he's given me another son. And we also just see the, the continued heartbreak. Remember, there's nine months of pregnancy, then there's the birth, and then there's the nursing until the next one. So this is happening over years. And then between son three and son four, something changes. And I'm going to read it, and I just want to see, you know, see if you can follow with me where Leah is going. So Genesis 29, 34, and 35. Leah conceived again. And bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me. Three sons. Come on. Come on, Jacob. Like, come be the dad. Come love me. Come take care of the family. You know, so she's so hopeful. So she says, uh, I've given him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. 
And then Leah conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Judah means praise. And then she stopped bearing children. What changed? What changed is that she had her eyes on Jacob. Jacob loving her. She wanted so desperately. She had this dream and this hope and this desire that Jacob would love her. And yet time after time after time, it's not happening. But she's just in pain and it hurts because she so desperately wants to be loved by this man. And so with Levi, she's still just, son number three, she's still just holding on. And then something happens between Levi and Judah, which means praise, when she says, now I will praise the Lord. And what we see happen is that she gets her eyes off of a person and she owns it. She takes ownership. She grasps on fully to her faith. And she says, now I, it's, it's here. This is where things change. This is where things happen, right here. Now I will praise the Lord. But how many of us know? I mean, I know as I was preparing this talk, I had something happen in my life. The last thing I wanted to do was praise the Lord. When we're in pain, when we're in darkness, when we're hurting, when that expectation is constantly right in front of us and not being met, our hopes are not being playing out and we're just being disappointed over and over again, the instinct is not for us to go, oh, I praise the Lord. You know, I mean, we might say it. It's kind of a fake it till you make it mentality, right? We might do that because someone told us we were supposed to. But it's not instinctual. What is instinctual for us is to force the dream. Do better. Make it happen. Grit. Strength. Run a few more miles. Go on another diet. Buy new clothes. Read the parenting books. Listen to the parenting podcasts. If I just try a little harder, if I just do a little better, that dream will come true. That person will love me. Or maybe we do this. This is instinctual as well. I want you to fix it for me. I want you to fix it for me. I need you to meet my expectation. We do this. We could do this with um, sports teams. We could do this with... Um, Hospitals and doctors, we can do this with schools and teachers, we can do this within our family units, we can do this within churches and pastors. Fix it for me. I need you to fix it for me. That is our instinct. You make my expectations happen. You make my dreams come true. So we look either to ourselves or to somebody else. Why? Why is it not instinctual for us to go from Jacob to praising God? And I think there's two reasons. I think the first reason is because what, we, uh, what gets our attention gets our praise. Listen to that. What gets our attention gets our praise. And oftentimes, we are so distracted in this world and in this culture Everything is vying for our attention. Everything. Look over here. Look over here. Look over here. Do this. Do that. Do this. Uh, make your own bread. Sew your own clothes. Grow your own food. Um, you know, I, build your own house. All, all the things. And it's all, okay, I got to do this and I got to do that. And all these things are vying for our attention. Think about what we give praise to. It's really easy, pretty instinctual to give praise to health to beauty, athletics, if you've ever been to any awesome, fun sporting event, and everybody's going wild and praising. That team has our undivided attention. We are there. We are in it. We praise success. We praise achievement. We praise strength. We praise talent. And these things are so much easier to praise. They're so much easier to give our attention to because they're right here offering it to us all the time. Pay attention here. Pay attention here. Pay attention here. And so the question for us this morning, as Christ's followers, is does God have our attention? In 2019, I was going through a season of just absolute exhaustion. I was so tired, and every day I was just like dragging through, trying to just keep going. 
And I was doing all those things. I had expectations of myself. I had expectations of being the perfect mom. I had expectations of being the perfect wife. I had expectations of being the perfect whatever I am here <laughs> on any given day. But I just had, I had these expectations and these hopes and these dreams of how I was supposed to live this life. And while I was going through this just deep exhaustion, uh, I was in a class, and I was reading this book, and the book suggested, I don't know if this is true, but it suggested that here in America, when we read our Bibles, we read them through the lens of, what does God do for me? God forgives me. God provides for me. God gives me peace. God shows me what my life is supposed to be about. God does this for me. And the author suggested that in other countries, they read their Bible from the lens of, who is God? Who is God? That's it. That's the question. Who is God? And I thought, you know, I'm going to try that. And so I actually have a journal. I call it my Who is God journal. And during this time of sheer exhaustion, I started just, uh, if you guys know me, I'm, I'm kind of all over the board. And so I'll just open my Bible to a section, and I'll just start reading it. And I'll write down some verses about God, and then I'll write who God is. Who God is. Who God is. So here's an example. 1 John 1, 5. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Uh, Genesis 1, 1. God is creator. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from God who does not change. God does not change. Um, God is spirit, John 4.24. God feeds the birds, Matthew 6.26. Numbers 23.19, God is not human. He does not lie or change his mind. God is perfect. He is flawless. He shields. He is righteous. He is a God of justice. He is gracious. He is full of compassion. He, he's a burden carrier. Those are just some. But this book is full of them. So who is God? So I began to give God my attention. And as I began to give God and put my attention on God, something happened. All of a sudden, inside of me, not because I was forcing it, not because I was faking it till I made it, all of a sudden, praise. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you bear the burdens. Sometimes in my role, I know a lot of the burdens here, and I'm tender, and so a lot of times the burdens are heavy. But when I read the word and I remember, or as a mom, my kids' burdens, wow, those can, those, you can just feel like the weight of your kiddos' burdens. But if all of a sudden it's like, God, you are the burden bearer. It's you, it's you, it's you. And you really can understand that God carries the burdens. All of the sudden, praise rises inside of us. So that's one thing I think why it's not instinctual for us is we're giving our attention to the wrong thing. And then the second reason I think it's hard for us to just go from our pain to praise is because praise also requires full engagement. Now, I didn't want to leave the guys out this morning, so I have a story for you too. King David. Okay, if you haven't heard, if you don't know about King David, David was a shepherd boy who fought Goliath, the giant, with a slingshot and a rock, and he won. Down went Goliath. Um, also, David was a young man that a prophet came into David's life, and a prophet looked at David and said, someday you are going to be the king of Israel. Now imagine that you are a young man, and someone comes to you, and you could be a young woman too, but somebody comes to you and says, you are going to be president. But you're young. What happens? You start to have dreams. You start to think about what could that look like. You start to have expectations of how that is going to play out. And so David's got these dreams and these hopes and these expectations. 
And then we find out as we read the story of David that there's another king in Israel, King Saul. King Saul is jealous of David, and so King Saul is determined to kill David. And so he's king. He has all these guys working for him. He sends all the guys out to kill David. And David is hiding out in the back corner of some dark cave somewhere. And while he is there, he writes a psalm. It's Psalm 34. If you're taking notes, write that down because I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to give you some homework if you want it today. Psalm 34. And Psalm 34 is this whole entire psalm where we see full engagement, where we see David hiding out in a cave fully interacting with God, full engagement. And here's just one verse. David says, I prayed to God and he answered me. He freed me from all of my fears. Now I want us to notice something. He prayed, that's full engagement, right? God, I'm, I'm fully here with you in this moment. But then we also see God freed him from all his fears. This does not mean that God changed his circumstances. This does not mean his life got any more comfortable. He was still in the cave. That did not change. But what did change is God set him free from his fear. And if you have ever been tormented by fear, I have, and God set me free, again, what happens is this praise rises up inside of you. Because to be set free from fear is beautiful. It is wonderful. It is so much better than anything here on this earth. When you know that the God of the universe set you free from something, all you can do is praise. Yes, amen, thank you. Yes, that is God. That is who we praise. Uh, Psalm 34 goes on. Um, David says from the cave, those who look to God for help will be radiant with joy. He doesn't say the help came. He says those who look to God, I'm actively engaged. I'm looking to God. And as I'm looking to God, there is a radiant joy that is filling me. He's actively engaged. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. He says this, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. Active engagement is doing our best to do right. We don't always get it right. None of us do. But trying to do right. God watches over those people trying to do right. And his ears are open to their cries for help. So this morning, this was my burden. This was my absolute burden. I sit with mamas all day long that are like, Stephanie, I'm failing. I am failing. My kiddo just flat out looked at me and said, no. I don't know what to do. Where's the book? Right? And I, and I sit with moms of teenagers who are just like, ah, help, I don't know what to do. And I just want to encourage you this morning. Forget about the podcasts. There's two things that you could do that will help you, empower you, give you strength, give you that thing that you can go from eyes on the failures of my children or my spouse or my, the company I work for or my school or my church or whatever. You can get your eyes off that and you can get to this beautiful, joyful, celebratory place of praise. And so I want to encourage you, one, go to the dollar store, buy a journal, write on the front of it, who is God? And every time you start to feel that pain, that disappointment, that frustration in yourself or in someone else, when you want to wallow and quit and give up and be done, when you get to that place, get out that journal, open your Bible to anywhere and start looking for who is God, who is God, who is God, and write it down. And then Psalm 34, I just encourage you, write down Psalm 34, um, write it in your notes on your phone, whatever, and read it over and over and over and over again, and do what David did in the psalm. Practice all those things that David practiced in the psalm. And I believe that that's what Leah did. I believe that somewhere between, um, somewhere between Levi and Judah, she did those two, two things. She got her eyes off of Jacob, 
onto God, and she actively engaged with God. I want to end uh, with this from 1 Peter 3 through 9, and it's in the Message Bible, and it says this, What a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have him, this Father of our Master Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life. And we have been given everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. The future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all. Life healed and whole. Life healed and whole. That pain will be no longer. I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of the fire proved pure. Genuine faith put through suffering comes out proved genuine. Do you think Leah went through suffering? Yes. But she came out of it proved genuine. She came out of it saying, I will praise God. When Jesus wraps this all up, and this is the line, this is the gold line right here. When Jesus wraps this all up, it is your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. His victory. It's not our performance. It is not our perfection. It is not how well our kiddos turn out. It's none of that. It's our faith in God over and over and over again. It ends with this. You never saw God, yet you love him. You still don't see him, yet you trust him with laughter and singing. Because you kept on believing, you'll get what you're looking forward to. Total salvation. Let's pray. Oh God, we just give you praise and we give you thanksgiving for mamas that you saw in your master plan, in your dream to create mothers and fathers and children. And God, we delight in that. Some days it's hard and we cry in that. But God, we are so grateful for the opportunity and we just pray that you would help us to love well. And we pray, God, that you would help us get our eyes off of the distractions and that you would help us put our full attention onto you. I pray that you would empower us today to engage, to actively, fully engage with you. God, it has to be you that when we walk out of these doors, it is your spirit that reminds us day after day this week to keep our attention on you. And we just pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Everyone said? Okay, now we have some more fun because it's Mom's Day. So here is what we're going to, it's going to get a little wild in here, so settle in for just a few more minutes. This is what's going to happen. In a minute, I'm going to read you a poem. Before I read you the poem, not right now, but before I read you the poem, I'm going to have all the moms stand, but not yet. Then I'm going to read the poem. And then after I read the poem, I'm going to say the magic words, let love, I don't know, I forget the word, commence or something. I have a Q word. When I say whatever that is, they know upstairs. All of a sudden, we are going to have children and their love spread all over this room. And they are going to be passing out these beautiful plants that Teresa Gray and the Learning Garden planted for us. And they're going to they're going to hand them to all the mamas. After you get yours, I'm going to ask you to sit back down because we're going to send the kids back upstairs so that they can check out in a safe, correct manner. And then we are going to finish by praising God. That's how it's going to that's how it's going to unfold. So, here we go. This is for the mamas. And I might cry. Okay. <sighs> Because this is so my heart, you guys. You might have the wild child, the one who speaks their mind, 
the one who doesn't listen, where patience is so hard to find, the one who does it on their own, who doesn't need our help, with stubborn ways and on those days will turn us inside out. The one that they call naughty, where strangers roll their eyes, the one labeled as hard, who often yells and cries. But often it's forgotten, these ones aren't really wild. They're tiny humans learning. And in fact, they're just a child. They're the ones who feel things deeply, who will have a voice that is strong. They'll lead with that big heart of theirs. They'll stand up to what is wrong. They'll challenge our way of thinking. They are gentle, brave, and bold. And they picked us to guide them in a world that can feel really cold. So maybe they seem hard right now, but they will change the way we live with so much good to come, you'll see, and so, so much to give. Mamas, will you stand and let the joy, the happiness, the fun commence? If you look over here, our family life director, Heather, is leading. Can we just give a hand to Heather? She is such an incredible mama, and to all you mamas, I just want to say thank you. You guys can just give them out all over. Give them to all the mamas. Some of you guys come over here. Come way over here and start getting these mamas too. And then mamas, once you get your flowers, you can go ahead and have a seat so we know. Just keep going, pumpkins. Oh, look at how many kiddos Heather has up there, you guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. Should we, let's clap again. If you've been up there, you know the room is not that big. And this is a lot of beautiful, beautiful children. God is so good. God is so good. Each one of these kiddos, an absolute masterpiece. Every single kiddo here, just an absolute God-created masterpiece. And God has a plan for every one of them. And us mamas, we get to help love them, pray for them. If you are a grandma in the room, you keep those prayers going, keep them going, keep them going. Those prayers are so important for our kiddos. I love it. favorite basil. Oh, smells so good. So good. Happy Mother's Day, you all. All right, and then kiddos, you guys, once everybody's gotten, you can go over to Miss Heather. Oh, oh, we, oh, yep, we have, sorry, you guys. I was so focused on making sure everything got done as, as organized as possible. Oh, <laughs> Okay, and as the kiddos go back upstairs, I just want to say this. I hope that you will really pay attention to the words of this song this morning. I very specifically picked this song as an opportunity for all of us to praise. So here we go. We're going to praise this morning. <laughs> 